Natural gas. It's the essence that lives inside us, that's raging to get out. It's the king of kilojoules. But how do you get more natural gas? So welcome back, my fellow to begin to oxygen not included. Today we are going to squeeze this oil well for all it's worth. Now this video stands on the shoulders of many things. The last couple of videos here, we processed this the way it was kind of like meant to work with all of its equipment, and then we started to process it in some more creative ways here using the thermal aqua tuna. This right here was unlimited power, and we've explored a couple of different options as well based on your guys' recommendations. And oh, how you guys have recommended. I have received so many messages, and so many of them were looking at sour gas here. So I hope you're ready for the sweet, sweet scent of unlimited power, baby, because we're gonna step it up a humongous amount today. So how does it work? Well, we're going to start with oil over here and we have to pump water into the oil well, which then gets processed a bunch of times in a machine that's going to look like this, which will ultimately come out as natural gas over there. If it looks complicated, that's because it kind of is. But don't worry, because I made a nice little simple flow chart to explain it. So this is how the gas is going to flow. We start off with water and we pump that into an oil well. Now the oil well already gives off a little bit of natural gas when a dupe comes by to s turn this little wheel right there. So that's kind of cool, but it's only just a little bit of gas. The main thing is that it outputs crude oil. Now this crude oil is going to get pumped into a room and you can see right here, it goes from whatever temperature it is to 400 degrees Celsius. At that point, boom, turns into petroleum. And then we go a little bit hotter, boom, turns into sour gas. Now that stuff stinks, unless we take that and then we pump that into yet another chamber, which is going to cool it down to minus 162 degrees Celsius. And at that point, it turns into methane. Now, once we have some sweet, sweet methane, we're going to heat it back up into natural gas. Yeah, it's a lot of steps, but trust me, it's worth it. Why is it worth it? Because we can power up 38 natural gas generators with this thing. And the natural gas generator gives off two byproducts. We got carbon dioxide and then we got polluted water. So let's start with the CO2. Now we have a couple of options when it comes to this carbon dioxide. One of the more interesting things to do is actually feed it to some slicksters. However, as you'll see in the next screen, once I get there, uh, that takes up a lot of resources. But essentially you have an option of getting crude oil or potentially petroleum out and then reinserting that back here to get more of that and make more of this. Um, and you also get some food because you're going to eat its babies because you're a nice person and you're hungry. Two other options that you have is to run it through this little machine right here, which is just going to scrub it away. And then you can run that to a water sieve. I just kind of recommend going back and forth like this. And then that consumes sand or regolith. But the cool thing is that since we have space available to us, we could actually just vent it out to space. That way we don't really use up sand or regolith, even though we have like about a thousand options of how to get more of that stuff. This stuff literally falls from space. So kind of unlimited. For the sake of this video, I'm just going to vent it away. Now, we still got some polluted water over here that we need to deal with. So we have to run it to a sieve, you know, that sieve or that sieve. We do have an option though to run a ranch. Now this cute little fish right here has an appetite of algae. However, it has the ability to turn polluted water into clean water and generate a fair amount of babies in the process. And considering that you're far into the game at this point, may not be a bad option. I estimate that you should be able to get over 8,000 calories per cycle out of this little option here. But again, that's kind of another idea for another video. So we're gonna be going with the water sieve today. And at that point, we finish the loop, everything starts over and we just run through it again. But I know what you're asking. Okay, that seems like a lot of effort. How much power are we gonna get out of this thing? Boom, my massive spreadsheet. So what I did here was calculate all of the inputs and outputs per the duty cycle to tell us how much of what we needed to happen. And that's what we have over here. Everything does what I explained on the last screen to certain quantities and what we should potentially expect to get out of this system here is up to 18,000 kilojoules. 18,000. By comparison, the last unlimited energy system we did down here, using a similar process, only generated about 2,000 kilojoules per cycle. Which is still a lot, but it's not 18,000. However, we might find that that number is quite a bit lower than 18,000 because there's a lot of really heavy equipment in this. So at this point, I've planned the work. Now we gotta work the plan. And if we're honest, you know, this here doesn't really look that cool. Like this looks cool, but this is just a brick of, you know, generators. Although it is kind of a practical arrangement. So if you really wanna build it that way, sure. But let's make it look cooler, huh? 
Now we're probably going to run into a couple of hiccups here, but let's start off with the very first thing here. We need water to go into the oil well. So I just put a pump right below it, and then I'm going to put this sweet little hydro sensor right next to it because we want that to build up to a certain amount before we run the pump because we it's about efficiency. So we take that and we make it efficient. Boom. Now the other thing we have going on inside of here is the natural gas, right? We gotta be able to handle that thing. Now there's a lot of different ways to filter gas. Matter of fact, I've got a link to one up there in case you need a couple different methods. But today I'm just going to use the standard gas filter because let's face it, we should have a lot of extra power. So that wraps up step one. We got crude oil and we got some natural gas. So the only thing missing here is a pipe that should probably go to a liquid reservoir before anything else. Alrighty, so now to take this crude oil and we're just going to run it right up into this area up here because this is where things get interesting, right? So this is going to be hot because we're on the hot side of a liquid aqua tuner. And then right here is where all of that oil is going to be. It's gonna get heated up, boom. Once it becomes a gas, it'll flow past the airflow tiles, which only let gas by. And then we'll pump it out down here because it'll all be gas. Makes sense, right? To make this work, I'm going to put a liquid shutoff right here. And at this point, I should mention that you do need space materials because the temperatures are so ridiculous uh, when it comes to this. We're well over 500 degrees Celsius, so thermium's probably just the safe option. All right, so now we need to flow up into here, and I'm just gonna give this a couple options to flow out. So we can go right there into that spot, but if there's already some liquid there and it's a different type, maybe it went to petroleum, well then I'm just going to give it another option over here. The point is it should flash pretty quick if we're doing it right, but we'll see. That's potential failure point number one. Well, no, that's number one. This is number two. <laughs> That'd be a lot. Okay, so down here I need seven gas pumps. So let's go ahead and line them up. One, two, three, four. There we have it, seven gas pumps. So at this point we wanna stack gas on top of itself. Another tutorial I did on that one. So what I'm going to use is just a bridge like that. Boom, there we go. So now 500 grams here will become one kilogram, which is the maximum for the pipe. Nice and efficient. This guy over here is gonna be lonely. It's gonna only gonna have 500. So now that I have sour gas, I need to pass that off to the chiller so that we can turn it into methane. So to make things cool and symmetrical, I'm going to run this pipe over that way, that pipe over that way, and just look at, make it look like that. Yes. I approve. So at this point, things are going to be extremely cold up here because we're now on the cold side of our thermal aqua tuner. I'm not sure if we're going to have to deal with ice or not, so I kind of have a tepidizer here. This ultimately should be liquid methane at the bottom. And if it's liquid and we don't get things too cold, be perfect. This design here is based off of the liquid oxygen video I did, well, again, up there. The core of what I'm doing here is I'm running radiant pipes through metal tiles right there and also um, having those be connected to temperature shift plates. So when the gas comes out of this vent, it flashes very quickly to a liquid and then falls away before it gets super cold. And if it works right, and this is a vacuum inside of here, then we may not have ice. We'll see. That's like failure point number three. After many hours of testing and debugging, I found that this was the most challenging part of this entire build. And it's because it's not necessarily straightforward. You can't just make this room cold and pump as much gas in there as you want because that gas will go in there and then it will drop in temperature and the whole thing will turn liquid pretty much at the same time. Ooh, wow, wow, okay, whoa, 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 everything's turned into methane. So because of that, you end up running a very intermittent sequence right there. So you don't get a steady flow of gas out of here. And that's what you really wanna have. So what I have going on inside of here is I have all of these radiant pipes and they're all made of thermium, by the way. And then I also have the metal tiles back here as well. But the one thing I don't have is a temperature shift plate. So because I, whatever, once I took that out, it developed a natural gradient of the temperature. So it would actually probably be better to have all the vents on one side and then, you know, to whatever, but you get the you get what I'm talking about here. What's happening is we have the warmest gas over here on the left, and it gets colder as you get over to the right. And because of that, um, you can pump in tons and tons of gas, and it will liquefy efficiently, and it goes straight into the pump down here. So 
That's the key, guys. That's the key thing to take away from this entire setup right there. Another thing that will definitely help you out is having some liquid reservoirs up here with a little bit of your super coolant inside of it. That's going to take in liquid and then balance the temperature because there's a certain surplus of liquid inside of there. That way you end up with a very even temperature throughout your liquid pipe. So now I want to pump liquid methane into the next chamber down here, which is going to heat it back up into that sweet, sweet natural gas. So what I'm going to do is pump that just over here like this and then deliver it right there. And you know what, just to be cool and symmetrical, because that's always good, make it go over there as well. Boom, just like this. And then a good thing that I think to have here is going to be a temperature shift plate, because not only do we have a metal tile that's going to be absorbing heat down here, through a mechanized airlock, which is working as a thermal coupler, we're going to flash that liquid into a gas very, very fast. Because I need to have seven of these down here, which right now I only have six. And I refuse to make it any bigger because it looks cool as it is. So I'm going to use that temperature shift plate right there and there. That should work out pretty good. Potential failure point number four. There's, there's a a few ways things can go wrong. All right, so before we move on here, I need to hook up these aqua tuners. I've reduced it down to four uh, in the interest of making things flow better. I mean, I got four vents up there, four tuners down here. It makes sense. So the next step here is taking this natural gas and pushing it out to 38 generators. So rather than having one giant bank of generators, because we want to make things look cool. I'm going to have 19 on each side, which unfortunately doesn't really divide out all that great. Way to be prime, 19. Thanks for messing up my symmetry. And boom, there you have it. That's a power bank if I've ever seen one. Look at all of those generators. Batteries, transformers, beautiful. Mmm, just, just drink in the symmetry there. Okay, don't look at this. Just drink it in from here. Oh, and don't, don't look at that or that. Not everything's perfect, but that, mm, pretty close, pretty close, I like it. Okay, but now we gotta plug it all in. That's going to be so easy. <laughs> At this point, if it's anything less than symmetrical, it's a failure. It's failure point number seven? Yeah. Okay, this took forever, but it's a work of art. Look at that, look at those pipes. It's nearly spaghetti, but not quite. Beautiful. I hooked all of those up backwards. Ah! Delete. Mm, try again. See and behold, work of art uh, 3.0. Check this out. Beautiful! That is cool. So the pumps are going both directions, right? So we got two pumps over here that's feeding into the majority of this, this stuff over there. These two pumps are getting split. The stuff that's coming from down here on the bottom gets met up with the last pump right there. So we got six and a half or whatever and that's going to go over here now this is a loop right this is one continuous loop right here and this actually comes from another video that i did which again i'll link up there um, which is a whole gas loop right there and using a filter to kind of pull from a gas loop and put it somewhere else i didn't really have a use for that loop but it fits perfectly here so here's what's happening so this loop runs up here and it runs through all of these different generators right but what i'm doing is i'm adding more gas to this loop in different parts of it. So it, you know, if I have a little extra that makes it past this last generator here, then it just adds up onto the first part up there and then just kind of adds to it and finds another spot to go in. So here's why this is important because these pumps over here are actually moving at a rate that's just more than the amount of generators it's going to support. So it'll pump at a rate of like 11.1 .1 generators when you have two pumps together. So you're always going to have a little extra gas that's going to move past these generators. This doesn't divide out evenly. So that allows the extra to flow around and then for other chunks to stack on top of it. Now this one right here, I might want to actually pipe out and you know, tee in to another spot in case, you know, just in case that's backed up. One final thing that I should mention here is that, you know, I'm using this little bridge right here and that evens the flow out here. You can see how over here on the left, it isn't really working that way. So watch what happens when I do this. The second I add this bridge, I then give this pipe a direction and now it runs smoothly. So rather than the gas being confused, it's just running nice, nice and smooth. 
All right, massage your brain, drink deeply from the caffeine because automation is up next. All right, so the automation for this system here isn't really as bad as it looks, but there's a lot of stuff going on. So I'm gonna explain it one piece at a time. Let's start with the easy one down here. This is set up to be above 10 kilograms, just in case we ever run that low. We don't run the pump and run an inefficient amount through the pipe, not a big deal. So if we follow this crude oil into where my system's vaping it up here, what I'm going to see is an a hydro sensor that's right here. So this hydro sensor is just trying to detect whether there's some liquid there. I also have another Atmos sensor down here that's trying to tell me if I've put too much pressure into this chamber down below. So if either of those are true, then what I'm going to do is turn the flow of liquid coming into here off. So when we watch this back at a faster speed, you can see that this has now become true because we have too much pressure there. So that is turned off and now it's running again. And we'll see that this number will eventually go back up and it turns off. So under normal operation, the hydro sensor here doesn't seem to be used, but during startup, you don't wanna to have too much liquid down there. Startup is an absolute bear on this thing, by the way. You need a lot of natural gas or just a lot of power. So the next step is the pumping of sour gas here up into our chiller. All I'm using down here is just an Atmos sensor. I set this to be above 500 grams and it just runs to all the different pumps right there. Since we're mostly over pressurizing this area down here all the time, this thing doesn't really do much. You can also see I have some batteries here. So if we just take a look at what's going on with the power grid, uh, essentially we're bringing power in from both left and right, just like this, but I use batteries that are downstream from the transformers. That way, if we suck this completely dry power, we still have enough power left over for startup. So it's a good idea to keep a couple batteries, you know, laying around. These ones here feed those aqua tuners right there. But since we're talking about the aqua tuners, let's take a look at the automation inside of here because it's kind of a little bit more complex. Yeah, see what I'm talking about? It's complex and it isn't necessarily straightforward. So I have, let's talk about this thermal sensor right here. This thermal sensor is hooked up to these two doors that I was calling a thermocoupler. So if you take a look at the temperature here, you can see it's super hot. But once this thing actually closes like this, uh, the heat will then pass through those doors and into that area up there. At this point, it's currently a vacuum. So you can see it starts to cool down because this stuff is very, very cold up there. So that is set to be below 600 degrees Celsius. The same with these other thermal sensors right here. They all act and do the same thing. It's just kind of a matter of space why I have more sensors. So the other sensor I have up here, again, is just about protection. If this goes above 95 degrees, so things are getting hot up there, then that will activate this, which an, an active door is an open door. So that's another way to protect this. So this sensor here protects the, te the temperatures down below. This sensor here protects the temperatures above, and that's how that works. We just use an OR gate in between. So the aqua tuners are a little bit more tricky because they are actually detecting the temperature of the liquid inside the pipes. Now, since we are running through a liquid reservoir, we have really nice consistent temperatures uh, that are flowing through these pipes or pretty darn close to it, which is a real plus. But this is the liquid pipe thermal sensor right there found under, under plumbing. And to filter out false positives, I just run this through a filter gate, just set to the standard five seconds. So this is where you can set your low temperatures. And what I want to do is I've set it to uh, above negative 180 degrees Celsius. And I've done that across the board here. So you can see over here, the one on the right is below that temperature or the, the liquid inside the pipe is below that temperature. So it's actually turned off. However, that isn't the only thing that will turn that that is needed to turn off the aqua tuner because I want that aqua tuner to continue to run if possible because I need that heat production. The heat production is key to getting the most out of this system. So only if this is getting too hot down here and this is getting too cold, will I ever turn off one of these aqua tuners. So let's say if we go above 600 degrees, so that becomes false, then both of those are false and that is when we actually turn off the aqua tuner. Otherwise, that thing's going to run. One difficult thing is that this thing can run even though the liquid has reached absolute zero. And at that point, it's just not doing anything good for you. It's just sucking up power. How to get around that is what you use is kind of a big heat sink up here so that you can pre-chill something like water and then pump that water out 
Uh, that way you can build up the necessary heat you need down here. That's kind of how you get this thing started up. Okay, so there's a touch more automation that we need to look at, and that has to do with the generators. You can do a lot with the generators. Um, you can run it off a battery to run it nice and efficient, only take the power that you need and only generate the power that you need, or in this system, since it is self-powering, uh, you can just let it run continuous. And here's the key, the real sweet thing about this power. Not only are we going to get a ton of power out of it, we'll actually get a net gain of water to the tune of potentially 1.5 kilograms per second. Think about that. You can use that to produce oxygen. You can even turn that into power. You can turn it into food. Yeah, natural gas is awesome. <laughs> So you can do whatever you want with the generators. I'm just using a switch to turn things on and off uh, so that I can connect it or disconnect it from the battery automation. When you have multiple outputs connected to the same signal, if any of those are true, then that entire signal is going to become true. The only other automation I have here is just a temperature sensor. And the temperature sensors there is because th this can get very, very hot over here, these generators. So this allows me to temperature control this entire environment here so that it doesn't overheat. Now, there's a, a pretty awesome chance, right? There is something cool that we could do. We could potentially take this, heat it up to the point where it's full of steam, and then cool it back down, and then we don't even need to have a water sieve down here. That's yet another cool idea that you can do with this. So instead of having, you know, instead of using up sand or regolith, the entire thing can actually just be completely self-sustaining. To make that happen, I think we'd use something like a memory toggle so that it would go up to a certain temperature, then we'd open it, and it wouldn't turn off until you go down below a certain temperature. And at that point, the cooling would turn off and we'd heat it back up again. So you'd have a big cycle. Again, cool idea, we'll have to cover it in another video. So this liquid here just taps into uh, this pipe right there. And then I just run it through some gradient around a big loop and that actually just cools it down. It doesn't really run that much. The other option we have for cooling is coming from the natural gas itself, which is very, very cold most of the time. So again, I just use gradient pipes or, or granite pipes instead of insulated pipes. You don't wanna use too much of that because that could potentially be you know, sub-zero and you end up with very, very, you just end up with ice. So you don't want that. You want it to maintain liquid, so you could potentially work these controls here to kind of control that, how much energy we're taking out of this and putting it back into the natural gas to get that. But you, again, you have options. So at this point, our natural gas is consumed and then we get polluted water out. And I have one last bit of automation down here. I just set this to be above one little kilogram right there so that it doesn't just run all the time, <laughs> which I could set it to be a little bit more if I really wanted to. But the water then flows back over here and it comes in from the other battery bank as well and just ends up inside of all of these liquid reservoirs. Very nice. Now I have an overflow here, so I'm just dumping it. But, um, because I just have, I have so much water and I don't really have anything to do with it at the moment. The sieve is automatic. Same with the well that we go right back in there. Boom. Everything is done, cycle complete, fully automated. Oh yeah, one last chunk of automation you can do here is maybe do something with this gas pump. You could put an Atmos sensor in there just like this and make that efficient. So if that is above 500 grams, then it'll run. Otherwise, we'll just have a little bit of an extra natural gas in there. I think I missed this one too. So this pump right here, actually it's set above zero. I could, I played around with this. I've set it to five, I've set it to 10. I'm not 100% sure what I want it to be. Actually, I think I'd, I think just having that run as fast as possible is the right way to go. Don't mess with it. So congratulations, you made it to the best part here. How much power are we going to get out of this system? Remember, we predicted that it was going to be about 18,000 kilojoules. This has only been about 10 hours in the making. <laughs> and I'm working on about three hours of sleep at this point. I hope, it, I hope we get the numbers I'm looking for. Come on now, give it to me. Previous cycle, previous cycle, here we go. Natural gas generators, 17,760 kilojoules. What was my spreadsheet? <laughs> what was it? 17,955. Ah, overestimated, but just a little bit, a little bit. Not bad though. I'll take that. I think that's a real win. However, what's the net? What is the actual gain that we have here? Hmm. Well, I gotta shut everything else off and run it for another cycle, and then we'll get the actual net that we get out of this. Predictions? I'm thinking about 12,000. 
That's just my random guess. I know that we're seeing 15,700 here. However, that isn't factoring in those big liquid aqua tuners because I didn't do all the math for all of the, the thermal energy that's moving around. I've spent enough time on this already. I can't calculate everything, can I? Please, no? All right, here we go. Look at that. Look at that beautiful machine. Look at that thing run. Ooh, I like this. This is awesome. Let's take a look at the liquid overlay. Beautiful. Look at that. The crude oil is just moving around like crazy. Polluted water is flowing in. Nice. Really, really nice. The gas overlay, though, that's, that's where everything's at this time. I could print that out and put it on the wall, and I'd be proud of it. Personal favorite is the decor overlay. Beautiful. Look at that. Look at how nice. <laughs> the one place you could not survive at all uh, is the only nice place to be. Everywhere else would actually just be the most demoralizing place on the on the face of your duplicates. Whatever. All right, let's take a look at the reports. How much power do we get? We have a net gain of 13,157 kilojoules. That's a lot of power. Not to mention we get extra water and the fact that we could potentially do this in such a way that it generates extra food and it doesn't consume anything. Infinite survival is legitimately possible <laughs> through this sour gas boiler. How about that? So there you have it. Natural gas is still the king of power. It's just a little bit more difficult to get there. To date, I think this is the most powerful piece of equipment that I've built. For those of you that can remember back a couple years, I did make a natural gas generator video that was similar to this, but not quite as big. I think this is the biggest one yet. And also, as I've mentioned before, this video stands on top of a lot of other experiments that I've linked up there in the cards. You might want to check that out. As always, thank you guys for watching, and thank you guys to all of uh, the support that I've been getting over there on Patreon. As I've mentioned before, I went full-time here on YouTube about four months ago, and it's been quite the journey. Started off about 33% funded, and after four months here, we've moved up to 85%, which is some pretty awesome growth. I'm just about to the point of actually being able to call this my permanent job. So thank you guys so much for your support. Stay awesome, and I'll see you again next time. Peace. Brothgar, out.